Hi, it's Jeff here from discoverdoublebass.com. That is the home of online video double bass lessons and courses. So if you're a double bass player, you want to learn more about it, maybe you're new to the instrument, maybe a bit more experienced, we've got something for you. There's a whole bunch of free lessons and uh, the step-by-step -step courses, we've got interviews, gear reviews, and discussions like the one that we're having today about jazz bowing. Um, and I'm really excited today because we're joined by a brand new tutor to the website. And I thought it'd be good for you guys to meet him and we could maybe have a little bit of a chat about this topic because I think for jazz bass players particularly, the bow can be a real challenge. You know, it's one of those things that sometimes you can kind of basically leave it in its case and not use it as much. And we all know what an incredible world of sounds there is available to us with the bow. So today we're going to be talking about jazz bowing with our new tutor at Discover Double Bass, Olivier Babas. So welcome. Hi, Jeff. Um, so Olivier is a French bass player and uh, you live in Canada at the moment, is yeah, this right? Yeah, I'm living in Montreal. Fantastic. And we've been filming all week doing this new course about jazz bowing and a series of lessons and I'm sure we'll be sharing those more with the audience. But I mean, Olivier, in terms of using the bow in jazz, what is it that you think stops bass players from, you know, using it as much as, as we can? I mean, there are certain players out there, Christian McBride, John Clayton Jr., who jump out as people who you know really have integrated the bow into their playing but i'd say that's the exception and i count myself amongst this that i love to practice with the bow and play classical music but i find it a real struggle to to kind of you know mesh it into my playing and certainly for you it feels i don't know i mean what's the percentage of time that you're playing the bow do you feel that it's it's really part and parcel of everything oh that's uh, a lot of questions here that's a big question <laughs> um uh, playing a uh, bass with the bow is like playing another instrument. It's yeah. a different way of uh, emitting a sound. And for me, it's almost two different instruments. It's really very different. It's not like uh, something you add to a bass playing. It's not like a pedal or a device that you add to something already existing. It's almost like a, something totally different. It's almost like having two different instruments. So uh, to answer your question, uh, why? so many of us uh, are shy to use it is uh, because uh, it's very difficult and very different from what we're used to do. What we're used to do, pizzicato and jazz bass, may be very difficult in certain areas, but we're so used to do it that when we take the bow and we didn't play it as much as the, as the pizzicato, it's really a, another world. And uh, your second question is, uh, was uh, how, how long and how much time should we, should we uh, invest in it? I mean, it's all a matter of what you want to do. If you want to be fluent at the language, you just have to speak with this language all the time. If you want to learn how to play the bow, and in, this case of, in the case of our course, how to improvise with it, I mean, you should, we should play the bow all the time. Uh, if, if we want to be good at the bow, we should practice even our pizzicato parts that we want to practice that we have to learn for our bands. I used to practice everything with Arco and I still do it, even if I will never play them with Arco, it's just, it gives you opportunity to work. So walking bass lines perhaps? Yeah, I work, things walking bass lines, play. grooves, uh, African music with Arco. I'm not saying mm. playing them live with that, I'm saying learn, when you learn, uh, when you learn a new repertoire, for instance, mm. for a new band, you have probably 15 or 20 pieces to, to learn. Learn them with the Arco at home and it will feel really easy and really natural when you when you'll play them pizzicato and at the same time you will really develop some rhythmic and sound and, and pitch skills that are really be gonna be useful for the rest. So it's just doing it the in quantity a lot and in quality very targeted to, to things that you want to do. It's such an interesting thing because it's like this entire new spectrum of sounds. Uh, you know, a friend of mine that was a drum kit player was saying it's a bit like him being asked to go and do an orchestral percussion gig. It's completely different. I mean, there are similarities, sure, yeah. but you know, the, the roles are so different and the, uh, the techniques that we need. I mean, how did you, um, when you were starting with your uh, journey on the, on the double bass, um, were you playing with the bow right from the beginning? And maybe you could talk on that a little bit and, and let us know where the bow came in? Was it always as a jazz context or perhaps as classical music? I'm not sure. Um, 
I, I'm initially I'm more of a blues and groove guy. I began with guitar. I still play yeah. it a lot, and then of course I played bass, and very soon I became a bass player, and naturally became an acoustic bass player because it's the acoustic version of the of the electric bass. So that's my path. So no, I didn't come from I didn't come, I don't come from classical, but very soon with the double bass I wanted to. I was inc intrigued by it. And through the music I played with all the bands I was working in, the more and more acoustic it became, the more and more it made sense to explore with the bow. So I started uh, playing with it really a lot on my own for a few years until I realized that I had to, I had to learn it properly. So I went to conservatoire just for, for that. And um, my journey continued, but I have to say, one one influence, major one, really drew me to to that. It was Edgar Mayer, mm. who to me really made the bridge between my my more blues and almost rock, but still acoustic mm. flavor and and influence, and this kind of whole new territory of of not only the classical, but I mean on an, on the instrument level, Edgar Mayer really was was doing the bridge between this whole world and he really drew me his influence drew me to explore with it I, I love the way that he uses um the bow in, in bluegrass i really love yeah. uh, there's some great players like uh we were talking about paul cowart recently and, yeah um uh ethan yodovich i'm not sure if i pronounced his name correctly but there were some great players on the sort of the new grass scene if Absolutely. you like who were using the bow and um, and uh, and it's a style who relates to uh, the more. It's a style to who that style bluegrass and all the culture around relates to the jazz culture in a in a natural way, mm. which can be a nice bridge to start with the arco. I don't. I'm not saying to play bluegrass to learn the arco. I, I didn't mm. do, but to listening to what the bass can do, especially those player and once again, especially Edgar Meyer, who's a incredible composer as well so who's giving himself some great opportunities to use the bow as well it's really interesting to use that kind of crossover style to mm. to see where the bow can fit because then you can bridge with the blues and the jazz yeah another shout out would be um uh, for craig butterfield yeah. Uh, yeah and he plays like i mean both craig and yourself have done a lot of videos where you're playing uh, jazz melodies with the bow you know donnelly and uh, craig yeah, did one craig is incredible he's just yeah he's yeah he's, he's ridiculous isn't he and, and both of what you you know you're both doing some really cool stuff with uh you know with jazz and the bow and craig is has done a lot of stuff with bluegrass i know you've done a lot with gypsy jazz J just yeah. before we move on do you, do you feel that Bass players have to have the Samandel book. You know, do you have to, do you have to play classical music? I mean, for me, I, I think that those like, are two different questions. Oh, go on then. Because Simandel is one approach to True. classical bass. You can learn classical. I didn't go through Simandel. So what did you? I what went, did you take? No, I went from a more uh, cello-oriented perspective and, cool. and worked on some cello etudes with my bass teacher at the time. Nice. So and through the back suites uh, slowly, hmm. but. Um, Simondel, yeah, I, I love, but that I don't think that I don't think that anybody has to do anything in mm. a certain way. The only thing is the amount of work and the inspiration you keep in the work you do, because if you're doing, if you're practicing, but it's just a mechanical way of doing it, and just okay, I get to get this right absolutely. No, it really has to make sense all the time. Mm. So you, I mean, for me, it's as important to practice as to stay inspired and to listen to musicians and of course great bass players and you you talked about some of them and yeah but in a lot of other instrumentists and styles as well i, I really think that being inspired especially in an exploratory exp, uh, in a in a in such a exploration mode yeah. uh, staying inspired by a lot of things is as important as the practice you do. But don't get me wrong, you, we really have to put the hours in it to make it work. Well, why don't we maybe sort of wrap it up by giving us um, some ideas about people to listen to for this inspiration. I mean, if I just, we mentioned Craig Butterfield. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we're on. talking about jazz, Slam Stewart is, yes. the, is really, to me, to me, is the reference. I mean, 
There is so much material out there. Uh, it's so good. Every time I transcribed a lot of slam and every time it's it's really good and it's very easy to analyze and understand how it works as well because it's extremely clear the fact that he's singing as well makes it easy to 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 hear to understand major holly they did a great album together yeah. as well major holly is a great great um, jazz bow guy outside of the the real jazz stuff of course uh, all the all the great uh, innovators uh, like Renaud Garcia Fons, Mark Dresser in a more uh, modern jazz uh, aspect, um, uh, Stefano Scodabigno, I think. Yes, I, that's yeah. sorry, that name is horrible to uh, pronounce. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's this guy has really composed incredible stuff, and it's really interesting to see, and a lot all the all the great jazz guys, and of course all other instruments. I mean, on cello, very close, uh, Rochad Eggleston, who's mm. a great, great, really incredible musician doing incredible stuff on the cello. Stefan Brown, a uh, German guy, Mike Block, uh, violinists, plenty of great violinists to check, and other instruments that have a nice sound relation to the bowed bass, if you're mm. going to check a, a trombone player or um, even baritone, sax ba uh, saxophone baritone player, it really, ha it really has some similarities with the way the sound is created with the bow, and it it can be a nice. Those can be nice examples. Mm. Well, so it was a lot of great music there, Olivia, and I'll provide links below. I mean, yeah. I guess the other person that jumps out in my mind is is always Paul Chambers yeah. as well. I mean, there's so many we could go on for you know <coughs> uh, for a long time talking about bass players that use the bow in jazz, but it's just such a wonderful world of sounds, and it's a different experience for people. And I'd absolutely encourage everybody to be using the bow. I mean, we talk about using it to improve um, your understanding of uh, your intonation. Uh, when practicing scales and what have you, but also it's just an incredible instrument in and of itself. So, yeah. um, listen, it's been really great speaking to you, and I've had a wonderful time this week hearing you play. It's just a thrill to hear the bow you so comfortably in a jazz context, and um, you know, we'll be sure to be sharing some of your lessons. Uh, just before we wrap up, where can people find you online? Where's the? What have you been been doing with uh, you know yourself? Where can people learn more about you? Um, of course, I've got my website, olivierbabas.com. You can find me. I'm quite active on Facebook still, personal page and artist page. You can, mm -hmm. I, I, I regularly produce music videos, mm -hmm. um, different kind, mainly bass and kalimba or jazz bowing. That those are my two main things, and uh, you know Instagram, Twitter, yeah. everything on the web, and of course in Canada live in yeah. the clubs and in the scene. And I'd like to also uh, let people know that Olivier does these workshops where he's teaching jazz and the bow in person in Montreal, I believe, every now and again. Yeah. Uh, so definitely make sure that you subscribe to his social channels. And if you haven't seen, this is a completely separate thing, but his bass and kalimba videos, if you haven't seen them, you need to see them because they are unlike anything that you will have ever seen. Um, if that sentence makes sense, I'll post a link for you below. So I'm sure that you'll enjoy those. And we'll be uh, sharing more material from Olivier, including a discussion between us about um, equipment and what you need in terms of equipment on the bandstand as an improvising basis with the bow. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.